All right. Well, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us at our second session here today. And thank you to our sponsors of this session, a New Flyer and Motor Coach Industries, for being a platinum sponsor with us. We're going to start off by introducing folks here to this session. Uh, the session that we've got is one that I think is probably the most important one, one of the most important ones for the entire conference going forward. It's entitled Battery Electric Bus and Fuel Cell Electric Bus Transit Operations, specifically focusing on mid to large size systems, those systems that have anywhere from 500 to 1,000 plus buses. And we really titled it as the good, the bad, the ugly, because we we're hoping to elicit, and we believe that we can elicit from some of the experts here with us today. Some of the lessons learned, the good things that have happened with being a leader in electrification, and then the realistic challenges that some of the folks here and the systems have faced in being the leader, the first out the door. Of course, we're going to be asking a little bit about what COVID means for all of this as well. So stay tuned for those questions. First, I'm going to turn uh, by way of introduction to our first speaker. We've got four speakers lined up. Bem Case from the Toronto Transit Commission, Eddie Robar from Edmonton Transit, Transit system, Q Lee from TransLink, and Anne Marie Carroll from York Region Transit. Bem, we're going to start off with you. And for those folks who are joining us online and attending this session today, we've got a few minutes of presentation by each of our panelists. And then we're going to move into an armchair question and field questions from the audience. Now, I do apologize. Apparently, my video is coming back a little bit choppy to folks, but hopefully, my audio is a little bit clearer. And we'll see if we can resolve that ahead of the next session. But in the meantime, I know you're all innovative, so you'll deal with my choppy frozen face uh, as we go through this panel session. Over to you, Bem, and we're going to start off with your presentation. Great. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the presentation to load up on my screen. So we see it on our screen, Bem, and just to remind you, you're able to control it so you can move it ahead. And I'll let everybody know as we're running up to the end of your minutes, uh, and I'll let you know if we need you to move forward so that we have enough time for questions since we're already getting questions coming in. Okay, great. Thanks. So first, a little bit about TDC. Uh, we're an organization of about 15,000 people working together to deliver, uh, on average, 1.5 million uh, customer trips each day. At peak, we deliver... 2.7 million trips in one day, and to do this, we routinely um, provide service through uh, uh, multi modes uh, with our fleet of 2,100 conventional buses, uh, 204 streetcars, 142 six car trains, uh, over 200 wheel trans vehicles, and over 1,000 non revenue and operational support vehicles. Um, in July of uh, 2017, Toronto City Council unanimously approved Transform TO Climate Action Plan pledging to reduce uh, GHG emissions or greenhouse gas emissions 80% um, by, by 2050. To achieve this, transit must be 100% electric. In November, just later in 2017, board approved a green bus fleet plan, uh, which transitions our conventional bus to all electric by 2040. Uh, phase one of the Green Bus program uh, includes the procurement of 728 uh, clean diesel buses, the latest uh, clean diesel buses. Um, a key part of our transition uh, is the procurement of 255 hybrid electric buses. And in fact, uh, in the middle of 2018, we received the last clean diesel, we'll be buying only hybrid and electric going forward. We also procured uh, 60 all electric buses um, installed and operationalized charging systems uh, and uh, the U.S. fleet. Um, since approval of the Green Bus program, um, we've, uh, as I say, uh, procured uh, 60 all electric buses, 10 are BYD, 25 from New Flyer, 25 from Mount Dennis. We have them deployed across three different garages. These were all brownfield uh, deployments. Um, we originally had the ESS uh, to manage uh, energy storage, or sorry, energy on each site uh, planned for March of 2020, but due to COVID, we had some delay. And so that will be deployed by the end of this month, uh, as late as uh, next month. And we have planned 
for full commissioning of the backup generator by September of, uh, of this year. As I mentioned, uh, we bought um, buses from each of the three manufacturers that currently supply long range battery electric buses. Um, this includes uh, testing of, uh, allows for the opportunity of testing of interoperability between particularly New Flyer and Proterra, but also looking at different evaluation domains, including accessibility, experience of customers and operators, uh, and of course, uh, vendor as well as vehicle and charging systems uh, performance. So I mentioned phase one. So phase two for us, and this is a draft list for getting schedule, uh, includes the ramp up of uh, buses across each of the garages to 34. And you can see that highlighted, the first three rows that are highlighted in yellow uh, over the next essentially four years, really, because the charging systems have to be in place the year before the deliveries come. Um, and, then, uh, and then again, across each of the garages to 75 which is 25% of the total capacity of the garages. And then uh, starting in 2026, ramping up to 50% to of the garage. And then our full first full electric zero emissions garage would, uh, is planned for 2029. Um, as I say, uh, with a zero emissions fleet by 2040. So, so far, um, uh, we've uh, achieved 41% uh, less GHG emissions. Sorry, this should be in uh, a presentation mode. I apologize, it's uh, an animation. So it, it'll show that since um, uh, since the board approval in November of 2017, we've reduced emissions uh, by 17%. Um, we've also uh, reduced the emissions 41% uh, over the baseline year from transform to which is 1990. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Ben, and thanks for staying on time. And for those of you who are not from Toronto, you might not know that transform to is really that radical plan, and I mean radical in the best possible way, for the city of Toronto to reduce its emissions by about 80% um, by 2050, if I'm not mistaken. And that is a plan that integrates shared mobility, intermodal, and transit at the forefront. And I think, Ben, you've really been at the forefront of the biggest integration of multiple manufactured products and services. So we're looking forward later in this uh, discussion to hear about the good, the bad, and the ugly, the lessons learned that you can bequeath and pass on to other folks who are looking to move into that kind of integration. And that's a natural segue to Eddie Robar from Edmonton Transit, the head of Edmonton Transit, given that, Eddie, I think your system was first out the door with the largest procurement, at least as I understand, uh, and it has moved into integration with buses that are possibly equipped for on recharging, but mostly going to be depot charged. I think a lot of people have a lot of questions about how it's going in Edmonton. We know from our own experience that you have a great project management team, so there was a really good project team around this. And over to you, Eddie. We're really quite keen to hear what's happening in Edmonton. All right, thank you. Uh, nice to see what's happening in Toronto, too. Um, certainly, the they have the largest fleet of electric buses. We have the largest single fleet of electric. So um, great, great segue into kind of what we're talking about today. We have uh, just under a thousand buses, uh, just under a hundred LRT cars and just under a hundred paratransit vehicles. So we provide about 87 million trips a year. And uh, certainly with my five minutes, I'm gonna kind of breeze through that part of, of who we are, most people know. So uh, moving on, stuff I'm gonna talk about today is, is really the buses are essentially the easy part of any electrification program. I think that where you get into more challenges is always the infrastructure, the background, how are you going to house them, where are you going to house them, and how are you going to charge them. And I think those are the things that, you know, we've been very um, clear to talk about and, and make sure that people understand uh, focusing on that part of the program is probably the most essential. Obviously, like everyone else, we have a greenhouse uh, management plan as well. And working through that, we really uh, are focused on reducing our greenhouse gas emissions as well and moving to electrification in our fleet. Um, certainly, our council wants to go all electric and only buy electric vehicles today. But uh, that's certainly from what you've heard around uh, around the industry is, is not possible on day one. But certainly getting a great plan to, in place to kind of make that possible is kind of where we're focused. 
So just a bit about the growth strategy of Edmonton Transit. And the first line is currently where we are sitting as, as a transit system, and we're moving into this medium term phase, which is the second line on this on this presentation. In our Kathleen Andrews garage on the far left, we're adding electric vehicles into that garage uh, and our Centennial garage as well. And we're also um, looking to make sure that we move into a new uh, facility that has the ability to house diesel and electric uh, vehicles. Right now, all of our garages are full, so we're looking to buy and or uh, procure a new garage for Edmonton uh, that will be a diesel electric garage, and we call that basically our swing garage. So we'll be moving our vehicles out of the facilities that we have today into the new garage as diesels, and then we'll use that to kind of move out diesels and make them electric. Uh, so this will have the capability to house multitude of, of different uh, electric vehicles, but certainly um, will be able to take diesels as well. And then the long-term strategy is really to move into that ability for us to have just an EV garage alone. So only electric vehicles in a garage where you don't have those uh, systems in place to deal with exhaust and all of that. But that's really down the road and probably a longer term objective for, for Ed, the city of Edmonton. A bit about the program timelines. I won't spend much time on this. The next slide kind of details out some of that. Uh, slide, but this is just for, for folks' uh, interest. We started this program in 2015. Uh, it shows you where we are in 2018 right now, and obviously we're looking to start our service of our electric fleet uh, this summer, so we're pretty excited about that. Currently, right now, we have about 21 electric buses of 40 on site, and those are Proterra buses. Uh, we're focused on right now training our operators and obviously our maintenance staff and what that book out looks like and what that EV charge time uh, looks like on streets. We're doing a lot of testing on that right now. Um, some challenging times right now with the with the training because uh, we're not able to get people up from the states just yet. So we're working through those challenges on the COVID side of it and uh, we'll be ready to go for launch of our, our service into regular service here uh, this summer. But these are the buses that we're using, as you can see on the screen, and, and that's kind of what they look like with the old fancy wrap on it. Um, Benefits, I don't have to go much into the benefits of what that looks like, but obviously the, the reduction in GHGs, uh, definitely much quieter than a diesel vehicle. Um, the ridership experience, we've tested um, that from uh, programs that we've done in the past to now, and certainly have got that great feedback from our customers on what that looks like and how that um, how that uh, that works and, and the response rate on that. And obviously the, the savings on the maintenance costs and fuel costs with less moving parts and oil and all of that. Uh, a bit on the, the facility side, I think this is where we spent a lot of time on our end of it, really looking at the operation of our service and how do you get um, focused on the operation first and then look for a vehicle that really fits your, your work. So a lot of question around short and long range. And I know uh, with Qtrick, we've gotten a lot of conversations about which is better and and we really landed on the long range part of the, uh, the conversation, but we've also future proofed ourselves between long range and short range. So if the industry lands on a short range bus, we're able to do both. So our buses can both trickle charge and overhead pantograph charge. So um, we do have the long range vehicle. Uh, we are very interested in making sure that a bus is a bus is a bus in our fleet and that we're not making a fleet within a fleet. And certainly from a scheduling efficiency perspective, making sure that we're not building schedules that are just to be at a specific location at a specific time of day to charge for a, sp a specific length of time. We're really focused on delivering that customer service first and, and really getting the efficiency out of our system. So when a bus is a bus is a bus, it gives us that, that maximum efficiency in our scheduling and allows us to do that. Not only that, we're actually, um, looking to do a bit we do things a bit differently in our garage we're charging overhead inside our garage and really that's about um, giving ourselves that space in the facility to ensure that we're not taking a footprint in the facility we know footprints at a premium and overhead charging allows us to not take up floor space or lines in a garage to make sure that we're able to uh, maximize that footprint inside the garage and not impact our operation as much as possible and Andy, uh, not not to rush you, but we've come to the end of your five minutes, so I'm going to rush you a little bit, just okay. if we can get to the, some of the core questions, because we do have a lot of queries coming through. So over to yeah, you. I'll, yeah, I'll blast through here. But this is just a quick uh, itemized uh, look at what the floor space looks like. So on the uh, bottom left-hand side, you'll see what it means to have chargers in in the, on the floor, and uh, on the bottom, on the top right-hand side, it's really a... An, the ultimate layout, which is very similar to a diesel garage in terms of the overhead pantograph charging. 
just to give an idea of what it looks like in our garage itself, there's a picture of the, um, the, the facility that we have, the overhead charging inside the garage, which is very similar to what you see outside of the facility. Quick look at the batteries and the, you know, if you're looking at the battery technology, it goes up underneath the, the bus for the most part, pretty slim, uh, gives us that long range that we're looking for in the, the system itself. And really coming to the end of the, the conversation, it's really about focusing on, um, focusing on your operations and really getting that bus that fits with what you're trying to do and ensuring that you get that efficiency out of the system that we all look for in transit systems. That's fantastic. Thanks so much, Eddie. And sorry for rushing you a little bit as we move to QLE at TransLink. And as we get her slides up, you know, I think a really important thing is to note, we just launched our Natural Resources Canada Best Practices in Transit Electrification. Maybe we'll come back to this, but actually at QTRIC, we never talk about long range versus short range. That's not the language we use. And so we'll come back to that in the dialogue. We talk about high power charging versus low power charging. And I think that's a really important technical differentiation because it feeds into the strategy for electrification. And Eddie, the language you use, actually comes out of the dialogue culturally that a lot of transit has faced in terms of what are they looking at and the language from sales and manufacturing versus the language of systems engineering. So I'm going to put that on a shelf for us to come back to because it's a critical issue and you raised and I think a lot of the queries uh, coming through for us are going to touch in on that issue, systems engineering. So with that cue, I'm going to turn over to you from TransLink as uh, we've got a systems engineer deployment there and over to you. Thanks, Josipa. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so on the screen there, you've actually got a picture of uh, one of our uh, our high power charger uh, with our electric bus uh, at one of our bus terminus. Um, so I won't go too much in detail about uh, TransLink as uh, I, I'm sure everybody is um, a little familiar with TransLink's organization, but this is a high level overview. Um, TransLink has been created by uh, Metro Vancouver to uh, manage uh, finance uh, plan uh, the region's transportation system and TransLink deliver these trans, uh, transportation services through uh, one of our few operating company. Um, Coast Mountain Bus uh, looks after over 1,300 buses, um, two, 300 uh, shuttles, uh, as well as four passenger ferries. And our BCRTC counterpart runs our uh, rapid transit uh, systems, uh, as well as the interurban commuter rails. And uh, you can find out a little bit more about TransLink uh, on our website at translink.ca. So we'll go right into our uh, our sustainability commitment. So back in 2017, um, TransLink board has made the commitment to support our local uh, and provincial government's goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year of 2050. And that has prompted us to create a low carbon fleet uh, transition plan. And really that plan is a roadmap uh, to guide us in how to uh, meet that uh, aggressive reductions. And within it, it's, uh, it's mainly focused on brief tiring our old buses uh, with a low carbon fleet um, in, uh, in various stages. Um, and uh, and also to um, uh, include studies and and a plan to upgrade our facilities uh, as well as plan out the charging infrastructure required to meet that transition. And around the same time, uh, Keytrek actually presented us with an opportunity to join their uh, phase one of the electric bus demonstration and integration trial. And uh, two years uh, from signing on, we've officially launched that uh, trial back in September of 2019. And um, although we're not the biggest uh, fleet rollout uh, across the country, uh, we are the most complex with uh, um, interoperability testing across multiple vendors, uh, both from the battery electric bus side and as well as the charger. Um, so right now we're running two new flyer uh, mid-range uh, battery electric buses and two Nova short-range battery electric buses. And they each get topped up um, at either end of the terminus. Uh, we have a, a Siemens high power charger at one end and an ABB high power charger at the other end. And so far, uh, we're about 10 months, not 10 months in, and the, the benefit has been great for all parties involved. Um, of course, the Vendors get to demonstrate their technologies um, as well as test out their reliabilities in, in the real operating environment. And uh, we've been working closely with the vendors to uh, improve the interoperability across all the equipment. And, and one thing we actually realized, um, it's not even just the interoperability across the equipment. Um, there's actually uh, interoperability 
uh, from our operator's perspective that they uh, that we see is important for them to uh, run these uh, run this fleet and technology seamlessly. And another important goal of the project is to gather data um, to benchmark this technology uh, with electric buses and a charger against our book out of the tra traditional uh, convention buses. And as well, the data we gather so far has also been very helpful for the vendors to um, identify any design gaps or oversight. And uh, they've been uh, able to make a lot of incremental changes to improve system reliability. And, and of course, with such, such a complex project, um, we definitely have a lot of lessons learned um, that will better inform our decisions uh, down the road uh, when we do more staged um, uh, rollout of the low carbon fleet. Um, having said that, there's still a lot of challenges ahead. Um, one of the biggest consideration is coming up with the capital to build out our charging infrastructure. And, and it's not just at one depot, it's across the network and across the region. And the before we buy battery electric buses, really we need to have these charging infrastructure rolled out, um, start planning and implement uh, probably around three years or more before we start ordering these buses. So that um, that limitation is also a bit of a guide for us to decide if we're gonna go with a short range versus a long range bus. Um, we know ideally with our operation, um, uh, long range buses do have uh, a more reliable service. Um, there's less for drivers to worry about. However, they're not able to meet our current service requirements. So we do see that in the short run, the, short, uh, the high power chargers with the short range battery electric buses uh, are a bit of a gap until we get to that um, endpoint. And, and because of that, we also need to rethink our service planning a little bit to uh, work around the adoption of these um, uh, long range versus short range electric buses. And we do see a need to scale up the uh, expertise uh, and techno uh, uh, technical knowledge, um, not just from our end, but also from the vendors and uh, currently because the technology is still relatively new in North America, um, we still see um, a lot of leaning on their European counterparts to help resolve some of the issue. So as more agencies are rolling out um, uh, charging infrastructure, we definitely see uh, a need to support, uh, to have local supports for all the agencies. And one thing we realized as part of the trial is there really needs to have a remote monitoring system, uh, especially for the short range, uh, as well as the on rate chargers, because it's so critical that uh, they stay up in operation. Um, if any time that a charger is down, it really disrupts our service. And to have the ability to have a real time alert for our operations, they can uh, more quickly um, respond to some of these interruptions and uh, try to minimize uh, any service interruptions or delay. So that's a bit of a nutshell about our trial. Thanks so much, Keely. Uh, and that was very helpful in terms of highlighting some of the challenges ahead uh, from that interoperability and the reliance on the European partners for North American deployment. So with that, I'm going to turn to our final speaker before we get into the questions from York Region Transit, uh, uh, Anne-Marie Carroll. And as we know, Anne-Marie, we saw the photos, the charger is up, the buses are here. Uh, so if you can give us a little bit of an update on what the status is, because I know certainly there's a lot of interest in um, north of Toronto, the integration of transit across Toronto, York Region, Mississauga, Brampton, et cetera. So very exciting to see that starting to emerge. So thank you, uh, Josepa. Uh, appreciate you having me here today. Yeah, it's a very exciting time. Uh, we are uh, within literally days away from putting our first electric bus into service. Uh, so that, that's very exciting. Um, as uh, Josepa mentioned, I'm Anne-Marie Carroll. I'm the general manager of York Region Transit, and we are just now embarking uh, on our first electric buses coming into service. So just to give you a quick little background um, on York Region. So we just uh, sit north of, of the city of Toronto. So we do often pick up the phone and, and call Ben to uh, you know, listen to what he's experiencing, uh, which has been very helpful. Uh, so that's always important, right? To have other people that you can pick up the phone and, and give a call to who's, uh, and find out if they're having the same challenges. 
Uh, the other big challenge we have, of course, is our geographical area. We cover a very large area. It's almost 1,800 square kilometers, and we have that uh, urban, suburban, and rural setting. So that, that's one of our challenges. And, of course, I report to nine uh, different uh, local municipal councils, uh, which roll up into a regional structure, uh, but uh, they all have their own uh, thoughts and opinions on uh, how to move forward with new electric bus technology. Uh, we only amalgamated uh, into uh, a regional transit network in, in 2021, but we've, we've certainly come a long way since 2021. And this is uh, one of the areas that, uh, that we're moving forward uh, in, you know, ahead of, ahead of a lot of others, of course, uh, in line with, with our other guests today. We have about 668 transit buses right now, but 560 of them are, uh, you know, 40, 40 to 60 uh, foot buses. The rest of them are smaller. Uh, bus sizes that uh, support our specialized transit. Uh, we have a, a variety of routes that we operate. And like everybody else had mentioned, our corporation does have a greening strategy. And uh, this greening strategy does identify that uh, York Region as a corporation is targeting to be uh, GHG free uh, by 2051. And the biggest component uh, that's been identified uh, as creating the largest amount of greenhouse gas emissions, of course, is transit at, uh, at 60%. And that Energy Conservation and Demand Management Plan, quite a mouthful, uh, but that's the name of our document, uh, is, is really what uh, initiated uh, the electric bus pilot uh, that we are uh, involved in with Qtrix and uh, developing our transit bus electrification strategy. And like uh, Eddie, very similar to what Eddie showed, we've been working on this for quite some time. Uh, we, we showed 2016, but we did start around 2014, 2015 in thinking about alternative fuels and what was the best direction to move in. And in that uh, same year of 2016, that corporate document was developed and uh, we joined uh, Qtrix in that year as well. Um, and, and that joining that organization has been really the thing that's allowed us to get where we are today. So thank you very much, Josipa and, and gang. So it's sort of been a, an up and down scenario, uh, funding, no funding uh, with the government. Um, but we did manage to get uh, you know, our council to agree to fund our first six electric buses 100% uh, uh, through, through the region. Um, and we have uh, now received those six buses and we're working towards implementing them. So that's what we're working on right now. Uh, they will be in operation in the uh, next uh, week or so. And uh, I'm happy to say that we're actually a year ahead of schedule because we did present last week to our council um, a strategy in going forward uh, to get us to be greenhouse gas emission free by 2047. Uh, I do have to report back, uh, you know, a few challenges. Everybody wants things done faster than what we say we can do them in. Um, but, you know, again, I'm happy with the aspect that we're actually uh, about a, a year ahead of time. Uh, but what we have done in the last uh, six to eight months is we did develop um, an asset electrification feasibility study. So what this study does, and, and it's actually a laundry list longer than what you see on the screen, the scope of the study. It was very quite it was very comprehensive we looked at the view we did a review of the state of the yrt system the way it is today we analyzed all of our routes uh, to see what routes we could actually operate with current technology we took a look at the the bus market uh, as it stands today and looked at uh, case studies what are other transit agencies doing as well and of course we had to do a review of our infrastructure what's existing and what we need to do uh, we've also engaged through this process other partners such as the hydroelectric uh, companies um, and of course we had to do both the operating and analysis uh, and operating uh, cost analysis impact as well and Anne-Marie, not to rush you along, but uh, we've got about half a minute left, so I will rush you along a little bit so we can get to some of the questions coming in. Great. So um, out of this study came our implementation plan. This is what it take, uh, what it looks like. Um, we did get agreement from council last week to order six more buses, so we will be placing that order very shortly. Uh, but this shows you the plan that we have. 
uh, which allows us to buy a small number of buses for the next 10 years. And we figured that was a benefit because we get all the infrastructure in place. Uh, you know, we'd hammer out all the technology issues that we might identify. Um, and of course, um, get us to uh, our 2047, but only buying electric buses as of 2030. So just to wrap things up, um, we are going through a transition phase. Like I mentioned, uh, we've recommended that we just buy a small number of buses over the next 10 years. Well, we look at uh, how tech, uh, technology uh, will advance, getting all the proper infrastructure in place. Uh, we need to look at costs because they're all the costing that we did was based on the cost as they are today. We are going under the assumption that over the next 10 years that those costs will come down substantially, which will make our business case look a lot better. And our target right now, as it stands today, is that we will be GHG free by 2047. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, and we certainly applaud the effort across all of these cities. Again, apologies if my video is a bit choppy, but apparently my voice is carrying, so that's good enough. Uh, we're going to jump right into questions then for this entire panel, because from Edmonton, where there's this large deployment, testing out in some deep winter conditions, we've got some questions around that. From Toronto to York Region, where there's some systems integration, a lot of data analysis happening, and I know for both Toronto and for York Region, data and data collection, data analysis is a big component of both of those, along with TransLink, where we just finished our first round of data analysis off those buses and chargers a lot of data cropping up and you know certainly at Qtrick we're data junkies and we believe procurement should always be evidence-based and data-based uh, and there's a lot more data emanating from chargers and buses now so now that you all have a lot more data from the performance of your vehicles to the performance of your chargers and you know in operations on that topography with that ridership what the kilowatt hours are looking like and how the systems are performing, how much range you're getting, how much you were promised. You've got a little bit more of that data under your belt. Anne-Marie, your system's just at the beginning of that. What would you say the greatest benefit is of having gone electric so far and what's meeting the standard of what you would have expected the system to look like? And what would you say the data is showing you is a problem uh, that if you could redo it or you could change it or you could just have known that before you actually went into electrification as a system, you really wish you could redo that piece. So Ben, we're gonna start with you. Um, out of the data you've learned, the experience you've learned, what's the best thing that's come out of all of this that's really surprised you or just made you really happy? And what would you redo if you could redo it based on what you know now? Oh, and Ben, you're just gonna have to unmute yourself. I'm on YouTube. There you go. Okay. Uh, the range of the buses have been pretty much on par with what we're advertising, what was modeled by uh, by QTrick, by ourselves, by the by the OEMs as well. So I, I would say that that's a good thing, obviously. Um, uh, I, I, I think that the, the one piece of, and I'll pull across if I can, um, my screen is not working right now. Okay, just went blank. Um, so one, one thing is that um, the bus reliability has not been as where it needs to be. And so uh, this is not uh, specific to one uh, manufacturer, uh, but we just by comparison for the hybrid electric buses achieve uh, an availability of 96% and a reliability of, of approximately 30,000 kilometers mean distance between failures or mean distance between road calls and change offs. Um, the electric bus fleet so far is achieving a 68% availability for service every morning and uh, about 15% uh, MBDF. Uh, so, and then charger availability has actually been very good. So charger availability is about 99%. And, and even some of those, uh, those uh, issues leading to the 1% of unavailability are kind of self-induced. Like we've done something wrong, not really... Uh, a system problem. Um, so, but I I wouldn't say that, however, though, that we didn't anticipate uh, a lower reliability. We did. We have adopted new technologies in the past. In fact, with every new fleet, even when it's an existing technology, but a new manufacturer, and there's some configuration of design for us, we have a ramp up of reliability in the early days of adoption of that, that new fleet. And so um, we are already seeing, in fact, these numbers are are very recent numbers, so we're we're seeing these numbers climb. And in fact, there is a uh, they're on an upward curve, and we expect that they'll. Um, it's hard to project just yet exactly when we'll uh, achieve 
uh, kind of on par performance with the rest of the fleet, but um, it's in the the near future and really does need to bear out though before we buy more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it sounds like reliability is the big issue, but it's within the range of what you would have expected being first out the door for an integration of really new technology. And Q, I see you nodding your head as well around that issue of reliability. So double barreled question, you know, what's the data showing you from the performance of your vehicles that you're happy with and what would you do differently if you can go back and where does reliability crop up in that? Yes, just Sita. Um, yeah, I actually agree with uh, some of the things Ben already highlighted. Um, we we kind of expect the reliability of the bus to um, be around 70, 80 um, percent um, uh, available for for bookouts. And what we're actually seeing is the buses on their own are actually performing fairly well. Um, but the challenge with uh, the buses, they rely on the chargers. So anytime we have charger issues or errors with uh, the drivers trying to charge, um, that brings down the reliability of the buses uh, because they need the extended uh, top-ups to carry on the, the, the rest of their uh, bookouts. Um, so from the current experience, uh, I found that um, we definitely need to be a lot more conservative uh, in terms of sizing the batteries for the routes. Um, we really can't squeeze uh, the, the the size of the battery to just make it a, a trip and, and back, um, that really doesn't leave a lot of room for uh, maneuvering in case um, an, uh, there's an error with the, uh, the driver's trying to charge up and then now he, when he gets to the other end, um, he's gonna take twice as long and that causes service delays. And um, as well that we found that um, it's if we have the capital to do it, uh, we definitely need to have more redundancy with the charging system so that if there's one charger down, um, the bus can also do a detour and charge uh, elsewhere and, and minimize the service interruption. Like right now we have four buses, which is fine. We can handle it. But once we electrify that route, uh, which is the current plan, um, there's really not a lot of room to um, to uh, top up the char uh, the buses at the terminus because then it'll also back up the rest of the system. And another important thing we actually learn is because now we're downloading this top up um, responsibility to the driver, we really need to make sure that uh, from their perspective, uh, we'll eliminate a lot of the human errors that, uh, that can present itself and trying to uh, look at it from uh, the interoperability from the operator's perspective. So by that, I mean, there shouldn't be different alignment markers for every different bus uh, at every different uh, charging stations. And um, the operation of the, the buses themselves, they really shouldn't have different procedures to uh, initiate a charge and terminate a charge. Um, we want to be as seamless as possible for the drivers uh, in order for this program of using uh, fast chargers and uh, short range bus buses uh, to work uh, seamlessly. Um, we also discovered that uh, because we have a, uh, a different uh, depot uh, design, uh, we store buses outside. Um, the buses do suffer quite a bit in the colder days, uh, which is probably like five, six months uh, of the year for Vancouver at nighttime. So they do uh, need that additional little uh, top up in the evening to warm the uh, batteries so that when the bus go out first thing in the morning, it doesn't also take a lot longer to top up um, the batteries uh, because when the batteries are colder and not at their operating temperature, um, it significantly delays the uh, the charging time of the bus uh, of the buses as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are hearing about, you know, the performance and the reliability of the entire system, both charger mm -hmm. and the bus side. And Eddie, I think you had a comment there about, you know, this is why you chose to go for depot based charging in particular and try to avoid uh, systems level on route charging. Did you want to jump in here on what have you learned? And then also, what would you do differently if you could rewind the clock and do it all over with what you know now? Yeah, part of what we were looking at was... Um really the operation of the system and how we schedule buses and how we put them on route. And I think that that really speaks to what Q is saying around, you know, if you have a charger go down and that redundancy isn't there, then you're either replacing that with diesel buses or you're trying to figure a way around that. Uh, part of the system that we have is our in depot chargers. We have multiple in depot chargers. So if one goes down, we have that redundancy uh, to be able to charge those vehicles overnight and still maintain the the service uh, capability that we need so the reliability of that system can still be maintained um, having that redundant backup uh, just in case so we we do over scope a bit of that to make sure that we have that ability to charge but certainly looking looking back at um, 
trying to, in the looking back question, trying to fit that into your facilities now is definitely one of those ones where I think um, you, you look back and you could do things a bit differently. I think uh, being cognizant of what does it mean to put electric buses into your vehicle, into your garages. Certainly we were building a garage at the time we procured electric vehicles and had to make some retrofits to our new garage that we were building just to um, increase the, the density of the floor and make sure that we could um, we could support those buses because uh, we have a parking garage underneath our facility. So uh, certainly parking those buses on top and making sure that we have enough weight there and uh, also being able to have the redundant backup if you have no power. So having no power at your facility, we actually had to throw an extra generator on site, uh, diesel generator, which is ironic, but um, just in case you lose power, you still need to charge those buses and, and have them go out if you want to reliably uh, use them in your fleet. So if you have a power interruption, you know, having that access uh, generator. So we have two big generators here at Kathleen Andrews, uh, really to, to back us up on that, to, to make sure that we have those redundancies in place and we get the reliability of those vehicles leaving the door every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and you know, Eddie, on that point in particular, like Alberta is moving more and more into t Tornado Valley, you know, in part climate change models have shown that. And just a little while ago, my, my niece and nephew had to go into their basement, I think a week and a half ago, because there was a tornado outside of Chestermere and, and then a tornado touched down outside of Lethbridge and power went out and my mom's power went out and this is an ongoing issue, right? If power is going out for flooding or for any other reason or for tornadoes, you still got to power the fleet and that might lead into design questions around how you design your depot, energy storage, redundant power and whatnot. Did you want to jump in on that? And then we'll go to Anne-Marie and I think Ben, you have something to add there as well. Sure, yeah, not only are we doing the generator side, but we are doing power storage on site as well. So we're using a new system called an e-camming system and we're actually dump, we're going to be dumping power into that system, store it for dumping it back to the buses so we can shave power off um, cheap times and, and dump it into our storage um, uh, systems and then dump them back to the bus um, when, we're, when we want to charge. So uh, it's certainly in that respect too, if we lose power, we still have that stored power that we can we can use as well. Yeah, very critical. And we're certainly looking at energy storage integration, right, with a series of companies, Ecamion being one of them, very critical to the future of mobility. Um, I'm going to move to Anne-Marie to make sure she has a chance here. And then Ben, I'm going to come back to you because I saw you nodding your head on that issue of energy storage. And we know that TTC's got storage integrated. So Anne-Marie, you know, your buses haven't been deployed in operational settings yet in terms of revenue service, but you've got a lot of lessons learned in just getting it out the door. What would you do <laughs> that you know about now? Well, well, first of all, I wouldn't try to launch it during the middle of a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's that's been a little bit tricky, right? Everything slows down. It's hard to get uh, you know trainers from the the bus companies and and such to come up. Um, you know, we've been really fortunate in the timing on how we're launching this is because we are learning from all the other agencies that have started. Like I said, TTC has been a big help. Our staff do go down there frequently and and learn from what, what their challenges are. So we're able to integrate that um, into how we're preparing ourselves uh, to launch our systems. We're going, um, we're, we're installing in depot charging as well as uh, overhead charging as well. So, um, you know, we have, we have both those options and yes, we need to start looking at the storage piece as well. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of built in a little bit of protection for us in case, uh, you know, one, one thing goes, one system goes down, we have the opportunity uh, to charge in another location. And all the things that uh, others have talked about um, on this panel, um, are again, lessons learned that we've learned from all of them and we are building all of that into our plan. And um, I think people just have to understand it doesn't, it takes a long time to prepare to get to the point of actually launching these vehicles into a system. And it's really important to have a plan in place and all the proper standard operating procedures and, and training documents and everything. I think, I think that's very important for everybody to, to understand. It's not an easy process. Mm -hmm. Complex, complicated, not easy. And nobody said saving the planet would be easy. So that's a really good point to raise. Ben, a last comment on this on the energy storage before we move to a few more questions. We've got a lot lined up and I'm going to ask folks to do rapid fire answers so we can get through as many of them as possible. But Ben, a comment there on the energy storage piece. Oh, we might. There you go. I had an agreement on the, uh, the rationale for the in depot charging. Um, uh, to start with, at least, I do see 
uh, on route charging is part of TTC's future, but uh, ultimately we need to be able to charge all of our buses, have the redundancy uh, that Eddie just described, we need to have the backup generation uh, such that in the term, in a long-term power outage, we can still deliver our service. Um, uh, we we have uh, we've had long-term outages in the past, of course, and our streetcar system is down, our subway system is down. The only thing that operates is is bus, and we get every single bus we have out on the street, and we have to still have that kind of availability in that situation. So, uh, key to that is energy storage and and uh, backup generation for sure. We happen to have a, a CNG backup generator. And that um, uh, kind of makes us feel a little bit better about the times we're, we're running it because the emissions are far better than diesel. But that's that was uh, not a not a cheap choice either. Very helpful. So the backup power that's there, and that's actually an interesting segue into the use of petroleum fuels for things like heaters on board, backup generation, does it not undo the greenification of it? And, you know, before I go there, just on the charger side, one thing we're looking at, one of our keynotes at this conference is Mayor Don Iveson uh, at the City of Edmonton. And we've had, we have several mayors lined up as well, Bonnie Crombie and Mississauga and Patrick Brown and Brampton, among others. And, you know, one of the ongoing dialogues is cities really just don't have enough revenue right now. If you had on route chargers and if you weren't using them all the time, which you won't be, could you sell access to them to trucking companies and make revenue for the city at times when the buses don't need them? And sure you could, but it takes a lot of system design. It's complex as Anne-Marie and yourself, uh, Bem and Eddie, you pointed to and Q. So with that, we're gonna turn to uh, questions from the audience. We've got a number of them coming in. And as I said, one of them was a segue from the whole use of petroleum fuels. So two questions, one from Lane Johnson um, to start with, you know, how do you get away from using diesel heaters on the buses? Because we've got a lot of cold climates in Canada and a number of your fleets have integrated buses that have diesel backup heaters. And there's always been the dialogue about, well, the heaters are not on all the time. So it's marginal amounts of emissions, but it's still not a full ZEB. So how do you get away from that? And allied to that is how do you get away from it, given that much to my surprise over the last six years in transit, I've discovered, as many of you already know, that a lot of fleets don't store their buses indoors. And so I think as Canadians, we think all buses are stored indoors and actually a lot of them really are not so how do you get away from diesel heating to prime the vehicle to heat the vehicle to get it ready to go especially given that we don't start all of our buses out uh, indoors and then allied to that how do you get away from petroleum fuels as your backup generator system undoing the green footprint of the overall uh, network so we're going to start in reverse and Anne-Marie I'm going to start on your end now recognizing the context here Bem and Anne-Marie and Q Lee you're in a jurisdiction where the grid is over 90% emissions free from an electricity standpoint. Now, Alberta, it's not the same scenario. So the dialogue they, does take on a different context. Over to you, Anne-Marie. Well, I think getting getting away from uh, fuel generated heaters within the bus, I think, you know, that was, um, you know, something we talked about as we, you know, prepare to buy our buses. Um, and I think at some point the technology itself will help us get there. Like we store our buses inside, except for one of our divisions and that that will change in the next couple of years. Uh, but all of our buses will be uh, stored inside. And, you know, again, to our plan, we're very cautious how we uh, recommend it to go forward because we, we feel that technology is going to change immensely um, in the short term. Um, but at least within that in that 10 years. And of course, we're going to be working with with others and, and Qtrix uh, to figure out, you know, how do we how do we get away from that type of technology and move to to green technology on the um, on the facility side of things? We are looking at uh, uh, solar panels, solar energy. Uh, so that's something else that uh, we're also looking at. Um, I don't think there's anybody that's been able to come to us and say, hey, I have a perfect solution for you. But again, I think it's going to be a process. And then over the next X number of years, you know, we're, we're hoping and crossing our fingers that all of this technology um, is, is going to be able to solve a lot of these problems. Yeah, and actually, had you heard Frank Mulan a little bit earlier in his keynote, someone did ask him, you know, can solar energy be integrated with energy storage at the facility to get rid of diesel generators? And he said, yes, yeah. you know, and it's another systems design thing, but it's, you're not, you're going to be the first out the door. So there's going to be some hiccups, but it's possible to do. Uh, on that then, thanks so much, Henry. I'm going to turn to Eddie because I think the question was targeting, in particular, Ed Edmonton, wanting to know, you know, what is the impact? And allied to the question, the, the question poser did ask, you know, what do you see in terms of range depreciation? 
transportation when you take away the diesel heater. And I can tell you from our modeling, we see 40%, 30%, 40% range destruction when you do need a full battery system to heat up the cabin. And then you save that if you have a diesel heater. And we've seen some of that evidence. But we haven't seen it. Edmonton, you have the real life experience. Uh, can you tell us how it is? Yeah, we're certainly seeing if we just went on battery alone, it would be about a 30% reduction. So certainly that is a large impact for us. And obviously with the weather that we have, we're not as fortunate as Vancouver. Um, we definitely have those cold weather days of the minus 30s and minus 40s. So when we see that, um, we're really trying to limit our use of the diesel uh, heaters themselves. So we don't use them until it really the extreme cold conditions that minus 25, minus 30, minus 35, 40. Um, if it was this winter, it was minus 50. So, you know, it was uh, pretty cold those days. So certainly the impact on on uh, on range of, of just using battery electric isn't a feasible option for us right now. Um, you know, as Anne-Marie was saying, the technology um, increase and, and it's it developing so fast. I think that um, we're cognizant of what that is and are, are definitely interested in, in moving away from them. But um, in our current climate, it's not, we're, we don't have the ability to do that. We're fortunate to be able to store all of our vehicles inside, which is helpful from our battery um, regeneration point of view. But um, certainly on the, the battery reduction side, we try to limit it as much as possible, but um, so we, we, we won't be able to get away with it in order for us to kind of be efficient and, and reliable in the, in the service and, and length of time that we get out of that. So 30%, if we go without them, is, is just too much for us to to kind of bear for a good reliable system. Very helpful, Eddie. I'm going to turn to you, Ben. Just recognizing we want to get through a couple more questions in rapid fire. If you want to feed into this query uh, about the move away from diesel heating and diesel generation. Uh, so I agree. Yeah, we're not there yet because uh, we've seen the same roughly 30% reduction in, in range if uh, if you're on electric heat only. We have um, a set point of about five, plus five degrees though. So we we turn that Wabasto on uh, much earlier um, than apparently uh, Edmonton does, um, but that's really to preserve the range. Uh, we still achieve and we're measuring um, or calculating um, that we uh, still achieve above 95% overall reduction in diesel fuel usage uh, for the bus. So, um, you know, we're still getting the vast majority of obviously of those GHG uh, gains. Um, uh, it's not so much of a problem for us for starting up the buses every morning because we have uh, in depot charging again. They're plugged in overnight at every, uh, in every case. And so there's a trickle charge overnight for both the buses that are stored indoors and the buses that we have uh, stored outdoors. Um, we have, uh, most of our garages have up to 50% of the buses um, stored outdoors anyway. And we've got two garages where it's all uh, outdoor storage. So we have to, um, be trickle charging during during the evening for that purpose. Very helpful. And so recognizing we want to get two questions and we're going to squeeze them in. I'm going to ask folks to answer this in a kind of yes, no format and then give us maximum, you know, your 20 second insight. This is totally self-interested in part, but it wasn't coming from us. Lewis Redford asked the question and he said, look, you know, TTC, YRT, Edmonton, TransLink, you get together once a year and you share data. How often do you share data beyond that, say at a conference? And then is it meritorious to start da sharing data in a more real-time fashion? And I say it's self-interested because as many of you know, we've been pushing for a data trust that all transit should be sharing this data in real time, buses and chargers on a cloud platform. So if Minister McKenna turned around and said to you all, look, here's a bunch of money for green transit, but tied to this tax dollars, the fact that you need to log your buses and chargers, they need to go to a cloud and everybody from every transit system needs to be able to see it in real time. Would you like it? Would you not? Is it yes? Is it no? Would that help you? Ben, we're going to start with you and then move to Eddie, to Q and to Henry. So we don't share data in that way, although we're open to sharing data with, with any of our peer agencies, obviously. Uh, we do share information uh, of the sort that we share during these conferences and in much more technical detail than that through a bi-monthly uh, call that includes quite a number of agencies across North America. And so there's a lot of uh, information sharing through that um, that form. Uh, but yes, it definitely would be beneficial to have uh, a data trust that everyone could draw on. That's great. And Eddie, I'm going to ask for your insights here. You know, would it be good? Would it be bad to have that revealed in real time and shared? I think it's fantastic. I, you know, no doubt the the transit community is a, is a small one, so we're not in competition with each other. So sharing that information and making sure that people are making wise decisions from people's experiences, I think is the, the best thing we can do as an industry, is share that information and make sure that we're making the right decisions as we move forward, as people kind of forge that road for us. So I'm 100% on board with something like that. 
Oh, music to our ears, uh, an orchestra, in fact. And so, Q, I'm going to turn to you because you know our shtick here, and you are already sharing data with two other systems, but it is culturally new to transit. Um, I'll actually, no, Translink has been very open in the past in sharing our data. Um, uh, we're definitely open to uh, their parties mining our data and helping to improve our system. So I echo uh, Ben and Eddie's feedback that we definitely love to share more data. And actually what I'm finding is uh, we actually need to encourage the vendors to share more data with us um, and to help us to better uh, run a better and more efficient system and having and having the real-time data and seeing any system hiccups uh, can definitely prop us to a jump into action for a plan B. Uh, a lot more quickly. That's fantastic. And Anne-Marie, last word on the data piece. So I'm all for sharing um, the data. I think it's very important to share information um, for everybody, everybody involved. I think the thing to think about, though, is how is that data utilized outside the sharing? It does become a concern at, at some point if people are taking that data and using it for whatever reason, could be in their own you know, committee reports or whatever, and it's not translated the proper way. So yes, I agree 100% in sharing. There should be some kind of protocols in place as far as the utilization of that data. Absolutely, and I mean, go even further, there's lots of companies that could commercialize the data, right? Turn into a lot of great tools, but then where are the boundary conditions? Um, so great question. We're gonna end on a question that was alluded to in the title of this panel, but none of you talked about fuel cell buses. So we're gonna hit that now. Um, fuel cell buses, if we're gonna use the language of long range and short range, they certainly are long range electric powertrains. Um, they are electric vehicles with a range extender. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for hydrogen fuel cell buses. The Jive Network is launching the second round of joint procurement in Europe. They're being procured more often now in the United States and certainly California. We're going to hear from some transit agencies this week that are going to hydrogen entirely. Um, so where does hydrogen land in your fleet thinking right now, given that it's not right now deployed in Canada since the Whistler trial? There, Q, we're going to start with you and go west to east across the country. Um, we definitely looked at uh, fuel cell battery um, uh, buses as part of our low carbon fleet. Um, however, at this time, we're not actively pursuing that um, uh, that initiative just because we don't have the uh, fueling infrastructure to support that. And, and it's really hard for us to get that system in place, uh, which is the reason why we haven't really considered uh, too far into uh, adopting fuel cell electric buses. Very helpful, very helpful. Uh, Anne-Marie? Oh, sorry, east, oh, sorry, west to east, Eddie, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought I'd mute myself there. Um, no, I think similar to Q, we're you know we're invested in the in the battery electric right now, uh, but not discounting any technology. I think that at the end of the day, you know, if we see the evolution of that come to a point where you know that's more interesting than what we're into now, and it makes more sense to make that transition, I think we would um, we would certainly explore those options and opportunities. And there's certainly a burgeoning hydrogen economy in Alberta today, so more to follow on that. Anne Marie. Yeah, so earlier on, we did our alternative fuel study. So we did look at all the different types of technology that we could have gone with. And, you know, let me tell you, in the end there was, you know, which way do we go? Do we go electric or do we go hydrogen? Because hydrogen was kind of bubbling up as a very interesting technology to look at. I think in the end, um, you know, we decided to go electric because, um, you know, most of our industry at this point was going that way. Uh, it had, you know, offered the most information. The the bus manufacturers um, were were starting to manufacture those buses. Um, so we felt like we had to make a decision on how to proceed. Um, and I think, you know, we had to think about, you know, what infrastructure do you have to build? Does it make sense to have multiple uh, technologies in your fleet? Um, I think right now for us, the answer is no, but, you know, over time, our minds can change. But right now we're sticking with electric. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. And Ben, last word on that, hydrogen fuel cell and TTC. Uh, so we we also did a, an alternate uh, fuel study, and um, uh, we're certainly not discounting hydrogen fuel cell in the future. But at this time, uh, there's already a significant incremental cost in going to electric. That cost is even higher for hydrogen fuel cell. There are the logistical constraints around fuel because we don't have ready access to fuel, uh, clean fuel in particular. Um, if we're going to generate clean fuel on site, then that's uh, all the more 
uh, capital costs required and requires footprint that we simply don't have at our sites. So there's some real uh, technology, logistical constraints uh, for us looking at hydrogen fuel cell, even though they, they give us the range that we uh, believe that we ultimately need for that one to one plus uh, replacement ratio. Um, I think that when you saw our electrification schedule, given that it's going to be many years before we have to put buses in each of our garages that have the full range of today's diesel bus, the battery electric will be there. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Ben, and thanks to all of you. I, if you attend the sessions later on this afternoon and into tomorrow, we do have a lot of discussion around hydrogen fuel cell electricity and our electric powertrain systems and buses. As many of you know, we are making green hydrogen outside of Toronto right now, but there's just not enough electrolysis in the country for your point, Ben, as raised. So lots of discussions about the systems engineering that has to happen. On the flip side, lots of jobs in the country around the technology. And so where's the economic stimulus going to go? So thank you again to Ben Case at Toronto Transit Commission, to Eddie Robar from Edmonton Transit uh, Services, from uh, Anne-Marie Carroll at York Region Transit, and Q Lee at TransLink from East to West. We really appreciate it. I think everybody's really benefited from understanding the highs and the lows, the great and the not so great, but in this march towards climate action, we recognize complexity is just something we're gonna have to overcome. So it's great to know that great brains are at the helm of the transit systems trying to do it. Thank you very much to all of you. Have a great morning and we look forward to having you join us later this afternoon to hear from mid-size systems that are facing the same problems you have, but with way smaller staff and way smaller fleet and way less experience. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone.